Hello, my name's Robert Lomas and I want to talk to you about a strange phenomena that the founding master of the Lodge of Living Stones in Leeds, Brother Walter Leslie Wilmshurst, said is the secret at the centre of Freemasonry. It's a phenomena called cosmic consciousness. So this video is about the Masonic path to cosmic consciousness. At the age of 70, Walter Leslie Wilmshurst was president of the Masonic Study Society and chaired his last meeting of it the day before he died. He described a philosophic model of the human spirit and related it to the teachings he found in the rituals of the craft. I have spent many happy hours reading his notebooks, checking through his source volumes to read his marginal annotations, and reading the lectures he presented to Masonic Lodges. And as a result, I have come to the view that the world can only benefit from open and frank discussion on the subject of human belief and our interaction with the power that underpins the universe. The power that many people call God, that scientists call the laws of physics, and that Freemasons call the great architect of the universe. Now, Freemasonry is not a religion. It's a spiritual technique that's compatible with the belief systems of every religion and the rational worldview of science. To join it, candidates must express a belief that there is some sort of order underpinning the behaviour of the universe. It provides spiritual values without a requirement to subscribe to an entire belief system. It's tolerant in a way that most religions are not, and its symbolic teaching allows a range of interpretations that encourages people of all beliefs. It allows them to take what they need from its system and whilst doing so to learn more about themselves and their spiritual needs. Freemasonry is an ancient science that can drive human ambition and achievement. It can offer great insights into the mystery of your inner self, whether you call it your soul, your spirit or your state of consciousness, and it does not conflict with the findings of modern science. From my reading of Wilmshurst's published and private works, I know he claimed that Freemasonry teaches a way to experience an ultimate state of mind which he called cosmic consciousness. I, however, was sceptical of this mystical experience and the fact that it was held out as the goal of Masonic teaching. In this talk, I want to tell you how I accidentally experienced this cosmic consciousness without seeking it in any way. It was terrifying and exhilarating in equal measures. But after the experience, I knew how exciting it was, and I was determined to learn more about it. I eventually discovered that there are two means to provoke a God experience, a passive route and an active one. I was fortunate that my first experience of cosmic consciousness was through a passive route which manifested as a God revealing itself to me. And I was also lucky that it was Thor who appeared behind me. I'd been researching him and his sister Freya, so I knew that no matter how scary they seemed, they weren't real. Had I met the dreadful Calvinistic Methodist God of my Sunday school days, I might have found it much harder to avoid becoming a religious fanatic, like Paul after his road to Damascus intrusion. But I had no inhibitions about analysing the physics of this manifestation and the practical causes of the vision of cosmic consciousness it granted me. But let me assure you that the passive route to whatever you call it, cosmic consciousness, peak experience or the God experience, quite literally puts the fear of your personal vision of God into you. As a Freemason, I belong to an order that's under the protection of St. Barbara, who is said to divert lightning bolts away from the innocent. Before lightning conductors were discovered, an operative Mason caught on a high steeple in bad weather would have to pray to her for aid. But when I was threatened, 
I was far too engrossed in the rapid sequence of events to even consider petitioning her. She, however, must have realised I was a Freemason in distress and looked after me anyway. I had a romantic urge to thank her, not least because she, along with Freya, who appears on the Kirkwall scroll, symbolise a key feminine principle that has shaped the inner teachings of Freemasonry. My story begins as I was driving up the road between Thornton and Queensbury in West Yorkshire, listening to Steve Wright on Radio 2. Once upon a time, I was a sceptical non-believer, driving up the road to Queensbury into an impending thunderstorm and listening to Steve Wright on Radio 2. <laughs> this narrow rural road is the shortest route between my home and my university, and I drove it often. At all times of the day and night and in all weathers. But on that particular day, the familiar views over open country seemed out of the ordinary. The natural light became garish and strikingly unreal on that road, which winds through a high, bleak part of Yorkshire. There was a storm brewing. The sky was darkening and I could sense a heavy feeling in the air. I drove further and further up the hill, the atmosphere got stranger. The landscape looked as if it was painted by Van Gogh on one of his bad days. The sort of day when the cypresses swirled too tightly, the crows massed together so closely that they eclipsed the sun. There was no other traffic in sight as I drove up the hill. The green of the fields was hard-edged and backlit against the bright, distant light of the horizon. The world ahead was now so dark that I deserted to turn my car lights on. As I reached for the switch I felt the hairs on the back of my hand and on my neck start to rise. It was an eerie feeling, as if I had picked up as a supernatural presence a hitchhiker. But I didn't want to turn to look at whatever it was in the back seat. Somehow I just knew it was Thor, the Norse god of thought storms, who was daring me to turn and stare at him. The whole experience was so unnerving that I pulled the jeep over to the side of the road. I felt unable to drive on with that threatening supernatural presence brooding over me. I pulled the car into the side while my fear of this ominous entity increased exponentially. Then I knew there was something horrible on the back seat of the car. I was seriously afraid of it. I had to pull in and stop. I couldn't continue to drive. I was now seriously worried by what I thought had crept onto the back of the car. It was something fearful. It was something dreadful. It was something I really didn't want to look at. I knew I had to force myself to face and confront the source of this feeling. It took a lot of willpower to turn round. But I felt I had to force myself, so I slowly turned, filled with dread at what I expected to see. But the back seat was empty. Then something wonderful happened. My viewpoint changed. I was swept up above the earth, swept away. I could see the earth below me. I could see the stars. I could see the cosmos. Time froze, and I felt a great peace and clarity. I could feel the stars moving in their courses as the spiral arm of the galaxy twirled slowly above me. I was held in the middle of a flame-coloured cloud, and for an instant I wondered if my Cherokee had caught fire. But then I realised that the light was inside my mind. My psyche felt as if it was exploding with the deep joy of the insight into the nature of the universe. I lost any sense of time, so I'm not certain how long that moment of ecstasy lasted. Then I was abruptly jolted back from this vision of cosmic consciousness into a frightening reality. A rapid sequence of events began that changed my perception of how life works, or at least of how I and everyone else with an electrically powered brain can perceive it. Then I had the shock of hearing light. It was followed by a click on the 
I'd had a mystical experience of the sort I'd always dismissed as irrational. It was caused by the massive build-up of electrical charge in the atmosphere brought about by the approaching storm. That intense electrical field had triggered waves of neurons in my brain, which I'd felt, first as an intense fear, and then, just before the release of tension from the lightning strike, as a mind-expanding moment. I heard the flash of light as the collapse of the field triggered my audio nerve directly. It was terrifying, even though I'd been safe. It will take me far longer to relate what happened than it took to live through it, as it was over in a matter of seconds. It began with a strong zizzing sound, which seemed to come from a source close to the light in front of me and to the left of the G windscreen. The closest description I can offer is that it was like a cross between a hiss and a sizzle, and it increased in intensity and died away within a single beat of my heart. As the zizz rose to its brief crescendo, I saw a bright flash of light which lit up the car from the direction of the field to the left of the road. Then as the zizz subsided, but before the light dimmed, I heard a sharp crack of electrical noise from the radio speakers. The light was from a strike of lightning, but lightning's always fascinated me. Whenever I get the chance to watch lightning, I automatically start counting in seconds. One, and two, and three, and four, etc. As I see the flash. This old habit kicked in, jerking me out of my timeless joy of cosmic awareness. By counting I can use the time gap between the lightning and the sound of the thunder to measure how far away the strike is. I know that sound travels at a thousand feet per second in still air, and so every five seconds between lightning and thunder represents a mile's distance to the strike. I counted one and two and, but before I got to three I heard the thunder. This put the strike between 2,500 and 3,000 feet away, or just under half a mile. The sound of the thunder came from the same direction as the lightning. I heard three distinct things. The zizzing sound which came from just left of the lightning strike. The sound of an electromagnetic pulse hitting the radio coming from the radio speaker. And the noise of the thunder which came from the direction of the light pulse. I'd never experienced this zizzing noise before, but I knew I was in a safe electrical Faraday cage of the car, so I watched carefully for further strikes. Two more strikes were accompanied by the zizzing sound, and the sound appeared to come from just to the left of the lightning strike. For all three strikes that I heard, my count took under three seconds. Two or three further strikes were over a mile away. They had counts in excess of five seconds, and I couldn't hear any zizzing sound, although the radio clicked in synchronisation with the flash. I made careful notes immediately after this strange experience while the information was fresh in my mind. I constructed this account from the notes I wrote sitting by the roadside a few minutes after these events. So what did it all mean? Well the sequence is clear. First I felt a period of ecstatic insight in which I sensed my mind expand to become at one with all creation. This is the phenomenon that Wilmshurst had called cosmic consciousness and it lasted for an indeterminate time. That vision collapsed as I heard the zizzing sound which coincided with the flash of light from the electrical discharge of the lightning. Next I heard the electromagnetic impulse of the strike by the radio speakers. And finally I heard the sound of the thunder caused by the wave front of displaced air hitting my ears. The interval between the zizzing and the light pulse was not possible to separate. It had felt as if I had heard the electrons rushing upwards from the earth to neutralise the positively charged thunderclouds 
as the insulation of the air broke down. The perceived volume of the ziz had increased in time with the intensity of the light, and as the ziz finished, I heard the click from the radio. There was ample time to react and start to count before the sound wave hit me, so whatever caused the ziz travelled as fast as light. It had to be an electric field that directly stimulated my audio nerve, which I interpreted as a sound. The fact that I heard the zizzing before I saw the light tells me it was caused by the collapse of the electric charge build-up on the hilltop. I must have been very close to the centre of this charge build-up that caused the strike. As the atmosphere ionised during the lightning spark, this electric field rapidly drained away and it caused the electromagnetic pulses I heard as a zizzing noise. The fact that the sound seemed to come from about 5 degrees left of the light implied that my left audio nerve had processed the signal marginally faster than my right, or that the electric field had been delayed or attenuated as it passed through my head. Now I don't think there's much in my head to absorb and attenuate an electric wavefront, but the sheathing of the axon of my audio nerve would offer a capacitive load to slow down the fast changing electric pulse. This would cause a differential rise time between the two nerves which were of different lengths, so creating a slight time delay which my brain interpreted as a slightly off centre positioning of the sound. It also accounts for the way the volume of the sound rose and fell in time with the light brightness. The delay on the radio signal was easy to explain. The signal had to be decoded by the radio set and transmitted to the loudspeaker, which then had to physically move the air to make the sound I heard in the normal way. By working out the rise time of the radio, the frequency response of the loudspeaker, the time of travel of the airwave, I calculated it would take about 50 microseconds to do this. This was long enough for the audio processing part of my brain to detect a separate sound. I couldn't hear the zizzing effect if the strike was more than 6,000 feet away. This confirmed it was an effect of the intense electrical field close to the lightning strike. The fast falling electric pulse was quickly attenuated by ground wave absorption and only if the strike was closer than 5,000 feet was I able to hear it. This was the closest I'd ever been to a lightning strike which was why it was the first time I'd noticed the zizzing effect, although I have since found I can hear similar sounds during strong manifestations of the aurora borealis in Orkney. The fact I could hear a light pulse brought home to me just how dependent my view of the outside world is on the way I interpret electrical impulses. I was suddenly aware that my whole consciousness as I perceived it through my senses, was an illusion caused by the electrical pulses channeled into my brain. I had proof that external electric fields could directly affect what I perceived. There was no way for me to detect what was a real sound and what was the electrical zizz of a close lightning strike. I had heard the lightning three seconds before my ears responded to the thunder. Believe me, to hear light is a scary experience. I quickly realised I had felt the cosmic consciousness which Walter Leslie Wilmshurst claims to be the secret at the centre of Freemasonry. And I now knew that the experience was indeed wonderful. But I also knew that the feeling that Wilmshurst called cosmic consciousness could be caused by exposing my brain to an intense electrical field. Is it any wonder that the ancient Greeks met Zeus when he threw thunderbolts at them? Or that the Norse feared Thor, the god of thunder, ranging from the mountain tops? Or that Moses met Yahweh, the storm god, on top of Mount Sinai during a thunderstorm? The neuroscientist V.S. Ramachandran calls what I had encountered a God experience. He described it saying, I've always suspected 
that the temporal lobes of the human brain are involved in religious experience when stimulated. It implies that our brains contain some sort of circuitry which is actually specialised for religious experience. Well, I'd certainly been kicked into a weird level of mystical activity by an intense electrical field. But Ramachandran's right. The electrical stimulation made my brain fire a whole raft of spiritual circuits on a Yorkshire hilltop when a thunder god spat at me. Wilshurst documented various active routes to seek out this cosmic consciousness or God experience. I experimented with these techniques and documented the methods in my book, The Secret Science of Masonic Initiation. Since I wrote Turning the Hiram Key about my God experience, I've interviewed many individuals who followed this active route, either through Masonic meditation or intense focused prayer. None of them seem to have experienced the brooding dread of an unseen presence and most felt they'd been honoured by an audience with their personal divinity. This can be a destabilising psychological experience and can lead to having a messiah complex. The few individuals I found who had had a passive experience by being too close to a lightning strike had it every one experienced the dreadful fear that preceded it and felt compelled to turn and face that fear before they experienced the moment of cosmic ecstasy. If you want to learn more about this fascinating mystery which lies at the centre of all the great religions and of Freemasonry then perhaps you might care to read Turning the Hiram Key and its practical associated Masonic workbook the secret science of Masonic initiation. But be careful. The associated experiences which are induced can be profound. And Brother Wilmshurst was very clear to have warned you to be properly prepared for this. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please click the subscribe box in the bottom right hand corner of the screen.